How many are thankful to be in the house of the Lord? Amen? This is the best place. I mean, this is better than the best jailhouse in the county. Amen? Amen. You say, what's that supposed to mean? Well, if you feel like you're a prisoner, then you know. But you, we hope you're free. Amen. Praise God. Always exciting to serve the Lord. We're in the book of Daniel, and I have just extremely enjoyed this book of Daniel. And we're, we are going to be taking the last 10 verses of chapter 11. And I've just about had enough of August uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphany had all I can stand of him. We're going we're gonna to look into the future. But all of chapter 11 is history, um, except for the last four verses for us. The whole chapter 11 is future for Daniel, but the last 10 verses are future for us. And the, the rest of chapter, oh, actually verse 35 back to verse 1 is history to us. And so let's stand for the reading of God's Word, verse 36. We're going to read down to verse 45. And it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is the determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire uh, of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the midst of, strong, of the strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with with um, uh, many ships, and, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, that's Israel, and make, and many countries shall he overthrow, be overthrown. But these shall escape out of the hand, out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and upon the land of Egypt. The, the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly and utterly make uh, away many. And he shall plant his tabernacles, that's his tent, of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. I want to use for a subject this morning, Antichrist becomes anti-God. may be seated. Antichrist becomes anti-God. You know, I'm not looking for a sign. I'm listening for a sound. The trumpet shall sound, and we shall be caught up to be with Jesus in the air. I'm not looking for an undertaker. I'm looking for an uppertaker. I'm not looking, looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. I'm not looking for antichrist. I'm looking and loving Christ. Amen. And so we need to understand, nowhere in the Bible does it teach that the church is supposed to uh, investigate and, and, and uh, uh, search out and find the Antichrist and show him to the world. That's, that's not, the, the church's place is not to introduce the Antichrist to the world. The church's place is to int introduce Christ, Jesus Christ, to the world. And of course, we don't want to be ignorant about it. We need to know what's coming even though I'm, I'm planning on being a few steps higher up in the clouds when it comes, 
But nonetheless, we don't want to be ignorant about God's Word. Verse 35 is kind of a shot into history, and then also a shot toward us. In fact, verse 35, I think it's kind of looming between history and today and the future. It says, and some of them uh, of understanding shall fall, and try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the end of time, because it is yet for a time appointed. And so that verse kind of shoots across history and then looks at us now and then into the future. God will, he gives us a warning that we are to be strong in him and not to be swayed by every wind of doctrine. Now, I have a very uh, compelling, very interesting uh, message this morning because Daniel is quite interesting. And the last 10 verses are our future, meaning that it hasn't happened yet. And a lot of people seem to think, well, you know, you got the kings of the south, the kings of the north, and the kings fighting this king, and kings fighting that king, and oh oh my, and you just get all this Antiochus uh, Epiphany, the fourth, and and all he did to the temple, and, and you thought, how do you know that the division is at verse 36? And the reason I know that is because the next 10 verses that I read to you cannot be duplicated in Antiochus Epiphany. It's yet future to come. And there's characteristics here. You know, the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and I'm not going to go there and read it because of the sake of time, and, and I preach too long anyway without me reading the whole chapter of Ezekiel 28, but Ezekiel 28 is about the devil. And the first 10 verses is talking about the king of Tyria. And the king of Tyra, if you'll read the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 28, it describes a very wicked man, a very horrific man. In fact, it describes a man possessed of the devil. It, it, it describes a, a, a devil man, this king, a perfect picture of the coming Antichrist. But then right in the middle of Ezekiel 28 verse 11 switches over and says son of man say unto the king of Tyre and and then it shifts over into a description of Lucifer who fell from heaven and so you see a transition that takes place at one time he's talking about uh, this demon man that's a picture of Antichrist, a perfect picture of the coming Antichrist. And then uh, at verse uh, 11, boom, he switches over to Lucifer fallen from heaven. And so it, it, there's a perfect description there. If you have time, read Ezekiel 28, and you'll see what I'm talking about, verse 1 through 10. And then there's a switch, verse 11 on, with the fall of Lucifer. And basically that's what we're having here. And we need to talk about some things that, that, um, that is very important as far as identifying some of the traits of this end time uh, evil. And by the way, the Bible uh, here in this uh, scripture reading, he's called the willful, willful king, meaning he'll do his will and not God's. He's called the king of fierce countenance by Daniel. He's called the man of sin by Apostle Paul. He's called the son of perdition by Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He has many names, uh, this Antichrist. Many names, this man of sin. Many names, this evil, wicked one. In fact, John calls him the beast in Revelation. And Daniel mentioned him as a little horn in chapter 7 of Daniel. And so this, this man has many descriptions of how evil and wicked and deceiving he really is. Let me say this. The coming Antichrist is a liar, a deceiver, and a God-hater. Bottom line, he's a liar, a deceiver, and a God-hater. And that's one of the things that concerns me about our nation. Too many people are starting to write God off. And that concerns me. Do, you, do I think that this nation is the Antichrist? No, I think the spirit of Antichrist is uh, mighty close on people's doors. And so the spirit of Antichrist is already here in the world. But let's look at some things 
And um, hopefully you'll understand these last 10 verses better by the time I'm done. The king shall do according to his own will. In other words, he'll not do the will of God. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation and accomplishment for that that it is determined shall be. In other words, God has determined that this man of sin, this Antichrist, will have a period of time in which he will reign in terror. Now, he'll have a uh, seven-year covenant he'll make, or he'll confirm it with Israel. And things will be rather kind of smooth the first three and a half years. But God is going to give this wicked, fierce king of uh, fierce. King of Countenance, God's going to give this Antichrist three and a half years to conquer the world with wickedness and evil. Now, I want you to understand something. The Bible says he honors the God of force, meaning that it's all about power with this Antichrist. It's all about power and control. Listen to me real quickly. We have enough nuclear weapons, enough... um, Bombs and and missiles and and neutron bombs. We have enough bombs in this world today to destroy the entire world, not one time, not two times, not three times, not four times, not five times, but over 100 times destroy the world completely. That's how much power we're sitting on right now. You ever heard someone use the term, he's sitting on a powder keg? Well, we're sitting on something a lot worse than that. And, and I'm glad that I've got Jesus as my Lord, and I'm going to stand on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. But this, this Antichrist will honor the God of force. Now, I think it's interesting that God gives him a time, times, and, and dividing the times, which is three and a half years according to Daniel. According to the book of Revelation, he's given 42 months, which is three and a half years. In other words, God is going to give him the same length of time as the Father gave His Son, Jesus Christ. Think about what I'm saying. God is going to give this Antichrist the same length of time as He gave the true and living Christ, three and a half years. But the true and living Christ, the real Christ of God, the Son of God, did not come to destroy, but to heal, deliver, and protect, and to save. Jesus Christ did not come to destroy one life. He came to give his life a ransom for the sins of the world. When Jesus Christ came, he came to heal the sick, raise the dead, open blinded eyes, bring blessing and and bring hope and joy to the world. When Jesus Christ came, he came to change the whole world and tell everybody on planet earth, including you and I that are in this room, there's hope for us because there's love of God for us. And Jesus Christ paid the sin debt for our sins on the cross of Calvary and he rose again from the grave. Amen. Now, Jesus came and conquered the world through love. And anytime you use force, you are going to tear something up. And so the Antichrist is going to be given three and a half years, and he's going to try to control and conquer the world through force. And through that force, he will destroy, and millions and millions of lives will be absolutely destroyed. Now, the Bible says that that Daniel had spoken three times about the abomination of desolation. And I mentioned this Wednesday night uh, in Matthew 24, verse 15, and, and Mark 13, verse 14, that Jesus Christ said, When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing uh, there in the place he ought not to stand, let him that readeth understand... And so he's talking about when you see him standing in the holy place. So when the Antichrist goes to the temple and stands in the holy place, and he declares that he's God, and he magnifies that he's God, then Jesus Christ said when that happens, that's the abomination of desolation. And when that happens, he says to the people of Israel, flee into the wilderness. Don't go to your house and take anything out. Don't turn back. Flee into the wilderness. 
And as they're fleeing into the wilderness, uh, there's a place given to them, as God told them in the book of Revelation, there's a place to protect them. And that place to protect Israel is for a time, times, and dividing the times, 42 months. That time of protecting Israel will be three and a half years. So while the Antichrist is on his rampage of killing and destroying, Israel will be preserved by God for a time, times, and a half, or dividing the times, for three and a half years. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12, and I'll show you what he's talking about, protecting Israel. Jesus Christ said when, when they were to see this, they were to run. And look at verse 13 of Revelation 12. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, the dragon is the devil, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, that brought forth the man-child, that's Jesus Christ. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that's a miracle of flight, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, that's three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent shall cast out his out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, and he that he might cause her to be carried away of a flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, in other words, the stragglers behind, those that were not uh, protected in the hand of God. And, and it says, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This place where these uh, children of Israel are going to is a place called Petra. And we'll, we'll mention that a little bit later on because I don't want to get ahead of myself. But it is a place called Petra. It is a rock fortress that God made probably in the beginning of time. He probably made it and arranged it in the floodwaters of Noah, and he prepared it, and it was a great city called Petra. And they would run to that. Even today, they put Bibles and food in Petra in the rocks. It's an abandoned city. I think maybe there are some people that live in it now, but it's a place where uh, millions can go, and they'll be protected in a place called Petra. In fact, you can walk. Uh, if you don't know Petra's there, you can walk by it and never know it's there. It is hidden in the mountains, in the rocks. And so the Bible says that um, the dragon will cast out a flood at Israel when she flees from the city of, of Jerusalem. And you could say, well, is that a literal flood? Well, I know that the earth opens her mouth and swallows the flood. So obviously the earth opening her mouth is an earthquake. So while the armies are coming after Israel, God will send an earthquake and whether it's a literal flood or an army a flood, you know, a flood like an army coming, whether it's water, and I think it could possibly even be a natural disaster, flash flood that will come, because I do, despite what people preach and despite what insurance salesmen say and despite what your insurance salesmen say, tornadoes are not an act of God. And this flood would be an act of the devil. And, and destruction is an act of the devil. God has his way in the whirlwind, in the flood. But it could be a literal flood where the earth swallows up the flood. Or it could be an army that the earth opens up and swallows the army. Well, during this time, the Antichrist is beginning his attacks. And he's, and he's, and he's, and he's already secured uh, Jerusalem. That's his headquarters. We'll see that later on. He's already secured Jew. You say, why does the Antichrist want to be in Jerusalem? Because that's where God is. That's where Jesus Christ walked. That's where God said, my name will be there. My heart will be there. My eyes will be there. My ear will be there. The Antichrist wanted it because he is kissing cousin to the devil. In fact, I think the Antichrist is the devil in flesh. And so nothing will do the devil but to have what God has. 
Because the devil wants what God has. The devil wants to sit where God sits. The devil wants to do what God does. The devil wants the city, not because the city is any more special than any other city. It's special because that's the city that God loves. That's the city of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the city that was promised to the people of God. And so that's why the devil tries to destroy you. Not that you're so wonderful and so precious and so sweet and so gorgeous and so nice and so awesome and so incredible. The devil wants you not because you are outstanding sweetheart. The devil wants you because your outstanding sweetheart, Jesus Christ, loves you and cares for you. And that's why the devil wants you because God has you. And the devil wants everything that God has. He wants to take it from God because the devil wants to be like the Most High. You can read that in Isaiah 14 and also in uh, Ezekiel 28 about the fall of Lucifer. But anyway, I I just want to point out some things because uh, you can't live in the day we're living without seeing some some satanic activity. How many many would agree that since there are nuclear weapons everywhere on earth... Have you ever stopped to think how many small nations have nuclear weapons? A lot of small nations have nuclear weapons. And, and um, I can't help but believe that the fallen angels want to be in charge of that. I can't help but believe that good angels, God's warring angels, are keeping those things from exploding. How many know what I'm talking about? Good angels are keeping... Now, you can't give credit to the men because they'll push the wrong button because they're hot-headed. You can't give credit to men. Boy, they've been so good about not using nuclear weapons. No, they've been so good about not using nuclear weapons because angels from on high, good angels are influencing even men that are weak and frail, keeping them from doing stupid things. Amen? You say, well, the Holy Ghost does that. Too many people have got to hold that button and don't know Jesus at all. And so the angels are working on that situation. And the bad angels would like to get hold of these nuclear weapons. And so I'm going to share some things that, that will uh, excite you. And I want to begin by verse 36. The king will do as his will, exalts himself, magnifies himself. And he speaks things against the God of gods. Uh, he prospers. But he's only going to have it for a little time. It says, for that, that is determined shall be done. So three and a half years is all he's going to have to be able to do his ranting and raving like he's doing. Neither shall he regard the God, verse 37, of his fathers, nor desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, notice it says, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Now, let's say this. Let's get it clear right now. Antiochus, the epiphany, the fourth, did honor the God of his fathers. He put up a god Zeus in the temple when he desecrated the temple of God. So Antiochus' uh, epiphany was not against God. He was just evil and hated God. Well, he was against God, but he believed in God and he hated God. Did you know it's hard to hate God if you don't believe in God? But anyway, some folks try to hate God and don't believe in God. And all they're doing is showing their ignorance because they really can't hate somebody that don't exist. But anyway, um, we know that this Antichrist will not honor any God. And, um, well, let's let's look at the, the Bible says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire of women. Someone said, well, that means he'll probably be a homosexual. Or someone says, well, possibly. The Bible says he's a lawless one. Possibly. You know, he is the lawless one, so possibly he is a homosexual. I don't know that he will be, but he'll be, he'll be some man. And he'll be a man that doesn't regard the desire of women. Someone says, well, the desire of women would be every maiden wanted to have, give birth to the Messiah. It would be a reference to the hate of Jesus Christ. The desire of women was to give birth to the Messiah, to the Christ. And that could be true. I think it probably is true. But someone says uh, he'll not regard the God of his fathers nor desire 
of women. That also could mean that he just, he just ain't in the women. It also could mean that the desire of women, you could turn that around and say, this is not desire for women. It says desire of women. So desire of women wants freedom. They want to live their lives free of human mankind bondage. And it could be an interconnection to Muslims. Because they won't let their women do anything. Of course, there's some that changing a little bit as we go. But the truth is, honestly, um, if, if you're married to a woman and, and you think you've got to cover her up real good, she must be a real looker is all i got to say. Hello. Amen. Come on. Yeah. They say, well, I, I want to cover her up because I don't want nobody lusting after her. Trust me. Trust me. Uh, that's not going to happen. But uh, the uh, Muslim world holds bondage over their women. So it could be the desire of women wants to be free. This may be a man who just hates women. He just wants to control women, just wants to be dominant over women. He, didn't, he doesn't listen to a woman with a child. Doesn't, he just may be just a mean person. I think more than likely he's talking about, in fact, he may be so busy he just don't have any uh, interest in women at all. He's too busy doing other things. But I, I, I come back and circle back around. I think he's probably talking about Neither did he regard Jesus Christ because he was a desire of women to be born through the, the little maidens. But anyway, it talks about um, nor will he guard, regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. In other words, he's not going to regard any God. Now, someone says, well, if it says that he will not regard the, 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 the God of his fathers, then he must be a Jew. And let me say this. That's a good argument, and I think he probably will be a Jew, the Antichrist. But he doesn't have to be. And the reason he doesn't have to be is because he'll, wherever he comes from, he'll not regard his father's gods. That excludes Antiochus Epiphany IV, because he honored the father, the gods of his fathers the Greek God, and the God Zeus. And so we know that he'll not be interested in God. He'll not regard the God of his fathers. Now you say, well, what if he is a Jew? Well, he's not a very good one. Hello? What if he is a Muslim? Well, he's not a very good one. What if he is a Christian? Well, <laughs> he's certainly not one at all. Amen? Are you listening to me? And so that verse is pretty clear that he will not desire um, the desire of women regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, we noticed in verse 36 that he, he, um, he, he blasphemed the God of heaven. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians and I'll show you what Paul said about the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 and four, and then we'll be looking at verse eight and nine. You say, why won't you read the rest of the scriptures for time, time's sake, time, time, time. Verse three, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, that is the day of wrath, shall not come except there come a falling away. That could be a departure, the rapture of the church, or just people getting away from God, the apostate. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice he's called the son of perdition. And then it says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called of God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. This is abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of, showing himself that he is God. Verse 8, after he does his reign of terror, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Talks about deceivingness and unrighteousness 
and, and all the deception that he brings with him. And so this Antichrist, Paul speaks of that he would be the man of sin. He would be the wicked one that would declare that he's God. Now, we're going to get into some nitty-gritty stuff, and, and, and um, I just want you to follow along with me because this really, you know, I've studied commentary after commentary. I've, I've researched and researched, and I never could quite grasp the phrase in uh, verse 38, but his estate shall be, shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not. And I, and I was really concerned about that phrase, the God his fathers knew not. And so the Bible says that in his estate, in his, in his kingdom that he begins to hold together, he will honor the, the God of forces. Now, someone says that's interpreted fortresses, but I want you to understand that the word fortresses or forces can mean the same thing. He will honor the locations of the nuclear weapons. He will honor the location of the most powerful. Now, notice what it says, and I realize I'm sharing something that some of you probably hadn't heard before because I didn't read it in commentary, but I read it right here in the Bible. And the God of his fathers said the God of his fathers knew not. How many would agree that the God of his fathers knew nothing about nuclear weapons? How many would agree that the God of his fathers knew absolutely nothing about the missiles and the technology that we have today? The ability to destroy the world in just a, a, a push of a button. Just a, a, a small conflict between two small nations could absolutely defile and cripple the earth forever to a nuclear confrontation. And so this, this God of his fathers knew not this great power. The Bible says, and the God whom his fathers knew not, in other words, he didn't know these great forces or these fortresses, shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. In other words, he'll try to buy the power. This Antichrist will try to buy the power. Gold and silver and precious things means nothing to him, but it, what, it buy, what it will buy does. And I want you to know that there's been more than one politician sell out for money. And there's been more than one nation sell out for money. And this, this, this Antichrist, he's not in it for the money. He's in it for he wants to be God. There's something down inside of him saying, go ahead. You can be as mighty as God. There's something down inside of him that says, I hate God. I'm going to be God. That's the Antichrist. And so he secures these nuclear weapon areas. No, it says, but his estate shall be, shall he honor the God of forces or fortresses or places of nuclear weapon. A God in whom the fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. So in other words, he'll buy all the things he can to have power. He'll buy power. He'll buy off power. I'm afraid there's politicians selling a lot of power off right now because they want their bank accounts bigger. And that's called greed, and it's called foolishness, it's called evil wickedness. Notice in verse 39, there shall he do in the most strongholds. Now listen to me. That's why I believe the fortresses and the strong places is nuclear weapons. Because it says in verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds. What are the most strongholds? The nuclear areas. The biggest, most military might. That's where the stronghold is. Not only is there a stronghold, but with a strange God. A strange God. Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. In other words, he'll give his... Uh, people that work for him that's on his side he'll give them divisions of land he'll give them things he'll give them gold he'll give them silver all for the prestige of having power in fact think about it if the rapture took place right now all your money would be left behind all two nickels if the Lord came back right now your fancy cars will be left behind the ones that leak oil and the ones that don't leak oil. The ones that start every time and the ones that don't start every time. 
but all your possessions, your home will be left behind. I mean, oh, Christians have a lot of possessions. And so when the catching away of the church takes place, the Antichrist is going to be able to take that first three and a half years and build more security because he's going to divide the wealth among the people that's left behind. He's going to divide the blessings and he's going to buy the power. And that's one way he's going to become number one. Who can stand against him? Boy, he's incredible. Why? Because he gave me a stimulus check that was really big. Now you say, preacher, are you against stimulus checks? No, send them on. I need stimulated all I can get stimulated. I may would like to be stimulated more. In fact, I'd like to be stimulated a lot. But this, this Antichrist will buy power. And, and you, if you think that's not correct, look how many billions of dollars we dumped on Iran. Look how many millions of dollars, trillions of dollars we've dumped in other countries. Why? Because we're trying to buy peace. We're trying to buy, uh, we're, we're the good guys. And, and you can't buy it. it. You know, sooner or later, the old ugly's going to lift up ugly's head and ugly's going to do what ugly does. Amen? And so the only thing that's keeping everything intact is this spirit of God, these good angels. But not only are there good angels, there are bad angels. There's wicked angels. And I contend that this strange God is a fallen angel. I believe that this strange God is not only a fallen angel, but a strange God that has control and sway over the nuclear weapons during the time of the rise of the Antichrist. You say, preacher, you got any Bible for that? Look at verse, the rest of the verse. Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. There'll be a uh, ten, uh, ten country European rise, nations coming out of Rome and also Grecian Empire. Uh, the Antichrist will uproot three of those nations because they'll defy. There'll be seven left. The Antichrist will will begin his attack, and the attack begins on Israel from the get-go, from the middle of the tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not called the time of church trouble. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jacob is not church. Jacob is Israel. So at the time of Jacob's trouble, then this, this Antichrist will pour out his wrath. So it's a strange God. I contend that this strange God is a fallen angel. I also believe that the God of whom the fathers knew not was nuclear weapons, great power to control, and thus he shall do in the most strongholds, meaning the nuclear areas, with a strange God. A strange God will yield and give him power over all this weaponry, all, of, all this power. Is this starting to fall together now? Starting to see more here? I trust that you're starting to see it. And at the time of the end, and we're going to get in some good stuff right here just in a minute. At the time of the end, that means at the end of the great tribulation, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the south is Egypt. Not only Egypt, but uh, it is Libya and Ethiopians. And the king of the south will push at him. In other words, Egypt and the Ethiopians and Libyans, Egypt will, will use a, a confederate army to come against the Antichrist. And Egypt will storm down against the Antichrist. And when he does, the Antichrist will crush him. Now, there's two interpretations of verse 40. One interpretation is the king of the south is, is um, Egypt, the king of the north is, um, is also um, the Antichrist, so they don't distinguish between the... They said when the king of the south, Egypt, comes against him, then the Antichrist will rise up as the king of the north, and he, like a whirlwind, chariots and horsemen and ships, he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow them. In other words, they, they interpret verse 40 as the, as the king of the north being the Antichrist, and that he will rise up and crush Egypt. Just literally crush Egypt. 
and, and, and he will paralyze Ethiopia and Libya because the Bible says that Ethiopia and Libya will be at his feet there in verse, at his steps there in verse 43. Now, I don't much believe that's the interpretation. Now, I've got some good friends that interpret that this king of the north is the Antichrist, but, and you may interpret that way too. So uh, I'm not making enemies right now. I love you. You're, but I just want you to know that I don't agree with that scenario. What I believe is the king of the south, which is Egypt, with his help of Ethiopia and Libya, will congregate together because this Antichrist has got totally out of control. And I believe that the king of the north is not just the Antichrist, but it is another division of an army that comes against the Antichrist. I believe the king of the north would probably be Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Iran, and deep north Russia. Now, a lot of people believe that Russia will attack at the end of the Great Tribulation, and I say, yes, they will. Others say, well, Russia will attack after the thousand-year millennial reign, the Gog and Magog, and yes, they will. But I want you to understand that there's nothing in this Bible that says Russia can attack more than two or three times. And so I believe that Russia will, with the northern parts of Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Russia will join with them, bring them together, and come down on this Antichrist along with Egypt because they'll be probably part of the Confederate uh, nations, the League of Nations, the Ten League of Nations, and they'll come down. And the devil will literally, the Antichrist will literally obliterate them. He'll win the battle. So whether you believe verse 40 is the king of the north, the Antichrist, or you believe like I do that it's uh, armies coming against the Antichrist, either way, the Antichrist wins. He crushes these people. The Antichrist has such power militarily that he crushes these people. He wins. By the way, the Antichrist will win at every battle until the living Christ comes and destroys him. The Antichrist will win every battle until the Christ, the Son of God, comes and destroys him with the brightness of his coming. And we see that also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and also in Revelation chapter 19. But let's look on at verse 41. And he shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. In other words, he is just, he just, he just taking care of everybody. But these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, the chief children of Ammon. That's actually Jordan. And that's where the children of Israel will go to Petra because Petra, that city, is in Jordan. And the Antichrist will not attack Moab, Edom, and Ammon, Jordan, because he probably sees, they're not, he probably sees that they're not a threat. The devil saw that they were, so he went after them, the dragon, in Revelation chapter 12. But the Antichrist probably didn't see it as a threat. And by the way, Moab and Edom and Ammon, which is Jordan, haven't been friends to Israel except for the last 40 years. So they've always been enemies of Israel. And so that may be another reason the Antichrist doesn't bother with Moab, Edom, and Ammon. He shall stretch forth, verse 42, his hand also upon the countries and shall upon the land of Egypt, and Egypt will not escape. That means he wins. But he shall, and by the way, Egypt may even try to attack again or get up again. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. I don't think Egypt's very rich, but they may have something we don't know about. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. In other words, the, the, the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be paralyzed. But tidings, now listen to this, he's in battle. He's, he's made his... He's made his dwelling place in Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where God, he wants to be there because God was there. He wants to, he wants to be like God. He wants to be, be God. And so that's why he cho chose Israel and Jerusalem. He didn't choose Moscow or San Francisco because God didn't choose Moscow. God didn't choose San Francisco. God chose Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of our God. And so the Antichrist makes his palace there. 
But tidings out of the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. In other words, he will win this battle. Now, I believe that this battle out of the east and out of the north, the Bible says tidings come from the, uh, from the east and from the north. He goes out to fight them. Now, in the east, you have, um, well, in the east, you have China, North Korea, Japan, and the Asian armies. In the north, you have Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Iran, north, and deep north-south, Russia. And all the countries in and around Russia. And these great conflicts, these great battles will come down against the Antichrist. If you go east far enough, you will cross the Euphrates River. If you go further enough north, you will come to Russia. Now, the Euphrates River is mentioned twice in the book of Revelation. It's mentioned once in Revelation chapter 9. It's mentioned again in Revelation 16, I think around verse 12. And we'll go there in just a moment. But before, before we go there, in the ninth chapter of Revelation... There is no mention of the Euphrates drying up. What it mentions is four angels that are bound in the Euphrates River. And there was an angel leading the demonic oppression. And I preached this in Revelation uh, years ago where I believe that those demons that come like locusts may not have even been seen. They may have been invisible. But it will be a burning, killing disease and people will be torn. Tor tormented for nine months Hell, hellish thing but then the ne the, when the four angels are released the, the, the leader of the, the demonic army that comes out of the pit out of the earth is called Abanan and um, what was the other name uh, Apollon I believe Abanan and Apollon and that was his name in the Greek it meant destroyer in the, in the Hebrew it meant uh, destruction but let me point out something that, that um, I think is, let, let's go to Revelation chapter um, 9. Revelation chapter 9. How many ever heard of the phrase, flat earth? I did that just so to wake you up. How many ever heard of the phrase, flat earth? Did you know in Hitler's day, which was probably the most detailed account of the coming Antichrist, Hitler was, probably the most detailed account of the Antichrist, the man of sin, was Hitler. He was a type, just like Antiochus Epiphany was a type. Hitler killed over 6 million Jews. And among the Russians and others that he killed, almost 13, well, actually around 13 million people he destroyed, 6 million Jews. What a lot of people don't understand about Hitler is Hitler was into black magic. Hitler was into sorcery. Hitler did not believe in the flat earth he believed in the hollow earth society. Now, don't, don't, don't just say, well, preacher, you're getting way out there. Google it for yourself. There is a hollow earth society. And those who believe in the hollow earth society, and Hitler believed the same thing. He believed in the hollow earth society. He believed that there were angels, powerful angels, powerful forces in the heart of our planet that are just waiting to be released. Wow, he got that right, didn't he? And he, he believed if he could get them angels to back him, that he could conquer the world. Well, the Antichrist will do that. He'll get these angels to back him. But God is the one doing the releasing, not him. Now, I want you to notice verse 13. The sixth angel, 
This is the sixth angel that blows a trumpet. The sixth angel blows the trumpet in verse 13 through 16. And he said, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now, I believe that one of these angels empowered Alexander the Great. I believe one of these angels empowered Antiochus Epiphany. I believe one of these angels empowered some of the others of the past that tried to control, Haman maybe. And these angels, I don't know for sure when they were bound, but I'm going to guess they were bound when Jesus died on the cross, descended into the heart of the earth, and I'm going to guess that they were bound at the great Euphrates River at the time of Jesus' death and his resurrection. Now, that, I may be totally wrong. I'm guessing that. Uh, that's a guesstimation. They may have been bound long ago, but obviously they had to be bound sometime after Alexander the Great died and some of the others failed. So it's impossible for the Antichrist to do what he does without some supernatural strength, without some demonic power. I'm talking about the evil Antichrist. Notice the six angel sounds and um, those angels that were bound in the great U Euphrates River. And Jude talks about them being bound in darkness. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. In other words, uh, let's don't get caught up on the, the, the hour, the day, the month, and the year. It just means that God has a time that this is going to happen. There's going to be an exact time that this is going to happen. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Notice he said, and I heard the number of them. You know what uh, he has just described in verse 16 of John, uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 16. He's described 200 million army, a 200 million horsemen army. Now, um, you could say, well, that's that's. And there are people that say, well, God's going to dry up the Euphrates to let this 200 million man army cross the Euphrates. Really? Really? Listen to me. There will be foot soldiers, yes. But I want you to understand something very quickly. Here in verse 9, it doesn't say the Euphrates River was dried up. It just says the angels were loosed. Now, this is the sixth angel that sounded. He's the angel with the trumpet. In chapter 16, it is the sixth angel, and he's the angel with the vial, the vial of the wrath of God. In chapter 16, the Euphrates River is dried up, but in chapter 9, it is not. Now, someone says, well, it's still a 200 million man army. In other words, the Euphrates is going to dry up, and 200 million Chinese and Chinese have bragged that they have a 2, two million man army. Well, let me say this. If a 200 million man army comes across the great Euphrates or, you know, the, the, the east is released across the Euphrates, um, they may cross the Euphrates after God dries up the river, but they're not going to be fighting in their own strength. These soldiers are not going to be fighting in their own strength because verse 17 gives us a hellish description of what they look like. And these are demonic horsemen. In other words, a lot of, you know, it, it's true that evil men are possessed with evil. And evil is a spirit. And so whether there's 200 million men coming across or 200 demons or fallen angels coming across, they're coming across. It's going to be a horrific time. Look at, look at uh, um, Revelation 16, verse 12. Now, some people say the sixth angel with the trumpet and the sixth angel with the vial is the same. They do it at the same time. Well, you know, okay. But you're going to have to really work hard to get them to coordinate here. But notice in, in verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof was dried up. For what purpose? That the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And he talks about unclean spirits working miracles and possessing these men and taking them over. So I, I want you to know that when Hitler said 
that he believed in the hollow earth society, he was 100% correct. There is fallen angels. There is evil spirits in the heart of this planet. Whether it's hollow or not, I don't know. I don't think you can actually keep an angel in a hollow hole. I think they're bound by darkness. If there's anything that paralyzes man more than anything else, it's darkness. I went back in Mammoth Cave when down in, uh, in Kentucky. I don't remember what part of Kentucky that is, but it's called Mammoth Cave. They took me back in there four miles back in the dark. They turned the lights out. I was paralyzed. I could not go anywhere. And that could be the paralyzation of these angels bound in darkness of chains. I don't think you can chain an angel, but the darkness may paralyze them so they can't do any more than what they're doing. And so um, the Bible is very clear that the earth does have within it evil spirits down deep in the earth. Whether there's hollow or not, I know not. Whether there's a whole society under there, I know not. But I know there's four angels that were there, fallen angels. And I know there's locusts that come out of chapter 9 of Revelation come out of the heart of the earth, the bottom of the pit. I know that uh, this strong angel, uh, abandoned and appalling, came out of the pit. So I know that there is evil powers beneath our feet. And they're going to be released in the end time, and they're come, going to come up out of the darkness. Anybody getting anything out of this? Now, let, let's come to the last part of this, verse 44. But tidings of the east shall come from the north. And, and actually, when, when they come across the Euphrates River, what well, is 200 million demons or 200 million men possessed of demons, it's described um, that they're coming together for the last of the Great Tribulation. It's the Battle of Armageddon. It is the last battle. And they're coming to Israel. They're coming after the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, and you know, I always thought, well, they were getting together to, to, to whip God. Well, anything that defies or, def or defies God is against God. And so when God comes, and, and I even heard a Bible commentator say when they see Jesus coming in Revelation chapter 19, they'll all look at each other, kiss and make up and fight Jesus. I'm not sure I buy that interpretation. But I buy this interpretation. Jesus Christ coming back in Revelation chapter 19, his vesture dipped in blood. Upon him is written the King of kings and the Lord of lords with a sharp two-edged sickle coming out of his mouth, and the brightness of his coming, he comes to destroy all ungodliness and wickedness and to destroy the battle of Armageddon. He wins. And by the way, he'll go to Petra first, and then he'll go from there into the valley of Megiddo, and there'll be a great bloodbath. Now, uh, the last verse, verse 45, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, and the seas here is the Mediterranean and Galilee or the Dead Sea. You say, well, how do you know it's the Mediterranean, the Galilee, or the Dead Sea, or all three? Because it says in his glorious mountain, there's only one glorious mountain, that's Zion. So in, the, in his glorious mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. In other words, the Antichrist wants to be God. He defies God. He blasphemes God. He wants to control the world. And through destruction and through um, uh, weaponry and through violence and through force, he wants to own the world. But Jesus is going to come back and say, you want to see force? Jesus coming back in chapter 19 Revelation, like, you want to see force? You really want to see force? Here you've been spitting little atomic bombs and spitting little old hydrogen bombs, and here you've been shooting missiles and trying to terrify everybody and killing people with the sword and crushing people's lives. You want to see power? Huh. The Lord descends from heaven with his church. He comes down into the clouds of glory upon white horses. And when he sweeps down across the atmosphere, he looks down in the valley of Megiddo and says, You want to see power? I don't know what words he'll use, but it will be something like this. It's over. Amen. Amen. The kingdoms of our God reign. Hallelujah. 
I don't know exactly what words he'll use, but he won't. He'll use he'll use his word. I mean, the Antichrist thinks he's really something, but God just said, "You're done. You're done." Someone says, "We as a church are going to get to fight." I don't want to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I mean, a lover, not a fighter. I don't want to fight. I heard a preacher say one time, bless God, we get to come back and whack heads and stab people and, and fight with Jesus. And I'm thinking, uh, I don't think that's the way the Bible teaches it. I think we're spectators. And some of you have had a lot of practice spectating over these years, but you'll be able to see God do the work. Amen. And so uh, Jesus Christ will come with the brightness of the glory. In fact, Paul said that he will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. And so where Jesus used love and compassion and grace and redeemed us through his violence on his body, through his death, to redeem us and give us an everlasting kingdom, the Antichrist tries to force himself on the world to destroy, and, 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 and so Jesus comes back and says, okay, you want to see me take care of things? And so Jesus sweeps down out of heaven with his church. I said, with his church. I said, with his church. And he's going to sweep down out of heaven with his church, and he's going to say, I'll show you the violence. You're done. I seen a movie, and I don't know who wrote it and don't know if it came from Hollywood or Smellywood or wherever. But I've seen a movie where it has Jesus Christ riding back and he says, it is finished, Jesus says. And these people are running with their swords in the valley of Megiddo and they're just exploding, blood just exploding, just exploding. Well, I don't know whether that's going to be the way it'll be, but I know this, God's word gets around, things explode. Amen. Amen. And so God will take care of this. He'll take care of all ungodliness. But God loves the world. He wants to give everybody a chance. And this Antichrist wants to destroy men's lives. We are ripe. We are ripe. The church is ripe for the coming of Antichrist. We are here at the place where the Antichrist could step on the scene and take over. And he will try to do it. And Daniel warns us of it. He talks about it. He says, and he's going to be given a three and a half year period of violence. And there'll be a three and a half period of his getting his things together and his military together and three and a half years of pulling everything together. But then when he has all he can stand, the Antichrist, and stands up in the temple and says, I'm God. And he uses words that blaspheme the God of heaven, the church, and Jesus Christ. God says, that's it. That's it. See, it's not the sacrifices being stopped that bothers God in the temple. Because the temple being rebuilt is kind of an insult to God. It's not the sacrifices that's going to make God mad. That's been, you know, the Antichrist will stop the morning and evening oblation, the sacrifices. And he'll, he'll erect an idol of himself in the temple and say, I'm God. That, it's not the sacrifices that, that, that are stopped by him that makes God mad. What makes God mad is the... The weasel stands in the temple in the holiest of holies and says, I'm God. There is no one but me. I'm God. I'm it. And you will bow and you will worship me. And God says, okay, three and a half years begin. It's time to clean up house. And what the devil, what the Antichrist isn't destroying, God is compelling men and women very strongly to turn from him and turn to the living God. How many of you got something out of this today? Very good. It's awesome. We'll be in the 12th chapter of, of the book of Daniel next week. But I want to say to everyone in this room, if you're not ready to meet Jesus, the Bible's very clear that if the catching away of the church takes place today, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, read it for yourself, that God will send them that know the truth and will not yield to the truth, God will send them strong delusion that they'll believe a lie. And if you're not ready to meet God, when, when, the, when the catching away of church takes place, when we're raptured out of here, and someone says, well, I don't believe in rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Neither is the Bible, word Bible in the Bible. Hello? The word Bible is not in this Bible, but I believe in a Bible. I'm holding a Bible. How many of you got a Bible? Wave at me. You got a Bible. 
I've got a Bible. Amen. I see some white ones, some black ones, some brown ones, and some red ones. The red ones are the best. <laughs> but anyway, once the church is removed, this whole world's going to go into nothing but deception. And if you don't believe in deception, just look at 2020. If you don't believe in deceiving people, look at 2020. If you don't believe in pestilence and dying and, and horrific things coming on the earth, just look at 2020. And 21 ain't starting out much better. Amen? I'd like to skip over to 24 or 25. Wait a minute. I'd rather just go up, be done with this mess. I'm like the, I'm like the Star Trek guy, Scotty, down on a, a foreign planet. He says to the ship when his little with his little flip phone that some of you still use. He says, he says B, uh, Scotty is the engineer, and they have their transporters there. And, and they flip their flip phone up, and they say, Scotty, beam me up. There's no intelligent life down here. And I want to say, Jesus, beam me up. There's no intelligent life down here. The world's gone nuts. But the Lord could come at any moment. And when he does, we'll be gone. Children of God will be gone. By the way, this church will be left here. All your bank accounts, all your car, everything will be left here. And it won't take the people long to be okay with your gone. Because a lot of them would rather have your bank account than have you. Hello. A lot of people would rather have your car than have you. Amen? Some people would rather have my suit, but nobody wants my underwear. But anyway. <laughs> Judy and I ain't leaving nothing for, the, for our kids. We're not leaving a thing. In fact, they should take care of me and Judy. Amen? We fed them and babied them, bathed them, took care of them and dressed them. That's their time. Feed me. Feed me. Amen. Now, I think we ought to leave things to our family, but I, I do think the Lord's coming soon. Amen. And I think a lot of that stuff don't matter at all anymore. Right. We're so close to the return of Jesus. Stand with me. If you're not a Christian, now's the time to make it right with the Lord. If you're not sure that you're saved, if you're not sure that you're ready to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, if you're not sure that it's time, uh, that you're, you're not ready to meet God, you're not sure that you're, you're a Christian, now's the time to make sure. Because this thing can change in a moment and twinkle of an eye. This whole thing can turn around in just a moment's notice. And you don't want to be here when the Antichrist is here. You don't want to be here when there's war and de disease and pestilence and demons and everything that's just upheaving on the planet. You don't want to be here for that. You want to be with Jesus. And let's pray for our grandchildren. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for our loved ones that they'll be ready and be prepared to go because there are some things worse than death. And I think the Great Tribulation is worse than death. I believe that. So we're going to give an invitation. Josh is going to play and sing. I'm going to invite you. If you're not ready to meet the Lord, come and make yourself ready to meet the Lord. Altar's open.